But the intervention has, uh, has, has continued for a long, long time, and now we're suffering the consequences. But before the war started by 2002, I had gone through the moral arguments against getting involved in war, the constitutional arguments about why we should fully debate this and make a decision and not give this permission to the president uh, to go to war, and the military arguments that it wasn't necessary and it could lead to trouble. And finally, I sort of threw up my hands and said, you know, what you ought to look at is the politics of it. If you won't look at the morality of it and the constitution of it and the military aspects of it, why don't you just look at the pure politics of it? And I said, it may turn out that it will be popular at the beginning, but in time, war becomes unpopular. It's an economic burden and the people turn on it and it's bad politics. So I advised them strongly that they ought to not get involved just for that reason. Of course, uh, there weren't too many people listening to that speech either, and, <laughs> and, they, and they proceeded uh, onward to, to do what they have, have done. But just look at, uh, you know, from my viewpoint as a member of the Republican Party and needling a few people in the Republican Party now about uh, a, a better policy, that I can seek out and find Republicans in, in times when Republicans benefited by taking this position. Some of us have heard over the past that uh, Democrats start war and Republicans get out of it, out of, get, get, get us out of them. And there's some truth to that. I mean, just think of the recent history. We had Eisenhower, you know, come, I'm going to get you out of Korea. Of course, Nixon was elected because we were so upset with Vietnam. And uh, that was a lousy uh, result because although he was elected to do it, he didn't do it and 30,000 more men were killed. And here again, of course, uh, there was an election last year, and, and look at the effort to close this war down. It, it's not happening. But Republicans have a tradition. There was a Senator Robert Taft who took a position of non-intervention. I think one of his, his best statements was that it made no sense to him after World War II to get into NATO. Just think how many dollars we could have saved if we had not been in NATO. A plenty. You know, we might have had our troops home by now, but of course we have troops now and uh, because of this intervention idea that we have had them in Europe since then and we have uh, troops in Korea. And it's amazing that we can afford it, but I think it, we're lucky on that because we can afford it only because we get to print the gold, we get to print the dollars and they're willing to take, the, take these dollars and do the production overseas that we can't and won't, uh, won't do here. But uh, ultimately, though, this will come back to haunt us, and uh, we will have to pay, pay the price. And already, I think this may be happening. I think that uh, the uh, uh, loaners, the lenders uh, to us to finance our extravagance, extravagance is slowly coming to an end. It blows my mind when we, I talk to conservatives and I try to emphasize them, do you realize that you can't even fight your war without borrowing from your good friends, the Red Chinese? And, and that's essentially it, and, and yet they pay no attention. So my, my uh, effort now will be, although I've emphasized these other reasons to stay out of war and, and, uh, and come home, I'm going to emphasize with many conservatives just the cost of it, you know, the, the literal cost that brings countries to their knees. And, you know, it um, reminded me of a story, you know, today I read a couple articles about, uh, you know, how the dollar is being under attack. And, and how it might bring our extravagant spending to an end. But many years ago, I served on the Gold Commission in the early 1980s, and that was right after we had uh, finished the 1979-1980 episode with gold soaring and the dollar under attack. So we had a Gold Commission set up to study the role of gold in the uh, financial markets. And um, there, there was a time, there was a day that I was finishing at the Gold Commission at Treasury and I was supposed to fly with President Reagan to Texas and uh, I didn't want to miss the Gold Commission meeting so my staff at the time made arrangements that I could fly with the President from the White House, just cross the street, get on a helicopter, fly on the helicopter and go out to Andrews Air Force Base. So I took him up on that wonderful offer and it was the time I probably had uh, with Ronald Reagan more than any other. And uh, it, when, uh, when, when he knew I was coming from the Gold Commission, he made a statement, I think it was a rather profound statement. He says, you know, he says, any great nation that has ever gone off the gold, station, gold standard ends up, ends being a great nation. And 
it isn't so much that there's magic about gold, it's just that there's the evil about the inflation and the printing of the money and, and the harm that it does. So here we are, you know, 25 years later, we're still spending, we're still trying to protect our empire, and we're barely challenging what's happening. But I think today, though, what is happening in this political campaign, there's probably reason to be hopeful. Not so much that I am the greatest messenger, and I do my very best, but I'll tell you what, we have a great message. Yeah. I've never worked with the, on the idea of being overly confident with my abilities, but I do work with the complete confidence that the message of liberty is a very, very positive uh, message, and it is the most humanitarian message of the world. You know, they turn us as libertarians and conservatives as, as being inhumane and lacking compassion. But if anybody has any compassion for their fellow man, it has to be in the ideas of liberty. And they have been ingrained in our system for so long. You know, it, it, the founders were geniuses. Uh, even with the imperfect document that we had, it was better than any other one. And, uh, and, and we have had great traditions, and, and yet, uh, today, we are failing to present the case. But the, 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 the case for non-intervention, whether it's in foreign policy or individual liberties or in foreign affairs uh, or uh, economics, it all makes so much sense, and there's no reason why we can't sell this message. The fact that we have received so many Inquiries and interest in the campaign to me is a sign that a lot of hard work has been done over the years. In the 1950s, when I first got interested in this subject, I went looking for books and to read. Of course, there was no internet. You surely couldn't get it off the television. I didn't get it out of my public school education. I wasn't getting it from my government. And that is when I discovered the Foundation for Economic Education. And uh, that was a blessing. Leonard Reed was the one that to provided the information uh, that I needed. And that was early on. But just think of what has happened in those years. I mean, there are dozens, uh, the Future Freedom Foundation and others. These are great organizations. I am absolutely convinced politicians don't amount to much, but ideas do, and what we do. So I think there's a lot of people out there right now wanting to hear this message. They've heard about it and they know a little bit about it and they're excited about it. But I'll tell you one thing that has really excited me about this, uh, this campaign is that uh, it seems like we don't have to give up on the next generation. I mean, the largest number of people that are coming into our campaign are young people. And this is fantastic, but you know what? It might be just very logical. Maybe they're waking up and figuring what kind of bills we're giving them. <laughs> maybe they're figuring out how much they're going to owe, and maybe they're figuring out that those young people have to go off and fight these wars. They also know that the Selective Service still exists, and they also know that everybody in the government, and anybody running for president, except yours truly, won't take anything off the table when it comes to intimidating Iran. And maybe they get a little bit annoyed with that. Maybe they like their privacy. Maybe they like their internet and they don't want to be taxed. So I think there's, there's a really a fertile field with this generation right now. So we are really excited about the number of people coming in into the campaign. So I think there's every reason in the world to be hopeful. That's not that I go to bed saying, you know, we have won and there's nothing to worry about. I think there are many, many great problems. But I am also convinced that Washington, D.C., is many, many years behind the people it's th themselves.